It's my great privilege to introduce Dr. Layton Ford to, to the student body today. Uh, Layton himself is an alum of Wheaton College. It's also the place where he got to know, meet, and soon marry his wife. Mrs. Jeannie Ford is with us today, sitting right over there, who also happens to be Billy Graham's sister. So really, gang, you're amongst royalty today. That's the way to look at this whole thing. Their daughter, Debbie, is also with them, and their son-in-law, wonderful son-in-law and dear friend, Craig Gurley. Welcome to you all. Dr. Layton Ford has had a many-storied life. God first called him to go public with the gospel. He is one of those that believe that the gospel message is in and of itself the great idea of humankind and that it should be thrust into the marketplace of ideas in every culture around the world. In that, he has followed Billy Graham. He's preached the gospel in every continent of the world except Antarctica. I don't know why you didn't go there. And uh, many of us who were raised on the preaching of Billy Graham were then drawn to the preaching of Leighton Ford as he brought a solid, thoughtful evangelism for us to hear about. So proclamation of the great idea. From there, he transitioned to more global leadership of the Christian church, where Leighton was actually the chairman of the Lausanne Committee for World Evangelization during the years when Dr. Graham and Leighton and others drew leaders from all the nations of the world together to talk about how do we take the gospel to the world. He served nobly as the great leader of that worldwide movement. And then we should be especially thankful because one day he asked Billy if Billy could come over and sit and chat for a minute. And Leighton had just gotten back from Texas where he had seen the LBJ, Lyndon Johnson Presidential Library. And he said to Mr. Graham, you know, we need some place in the world where thoughtful and innovative evangelism can be talked about and then spread throughout the world. And Mr. Graham kind of liked that idea. That was 1971. And in the next few years came the fruition of the Billy Graham Center for World Evangelization, which Mr. Graham chose to place at Wheaton College. So you have a proclaimer of the great idea to the world. You have a leader of the church to the great idea in the world. And then I'm especially grateful because Layton received a very special call to literally start to step aside from the global platforms and start to give himself one-on-one -on -one to younger men and women whom God was calling for evangelism leadership. He has a wonderful axiom that he uses. It's his dream, it's his aspiration that he might be a friend on the journey and an artist of the soul to those that are growing in Christ. One day I got a completely unsought letter in the mail. It was personal. It came from North Carolina to California and it was from a man named Leighton Ford inviting me to come and just hang out with him for a day. That was 22 years ago, and uh, he's my father in the faith. So I welcome to you a proclaimer of the greatest of all ideas, a leader of world evangelization, and a friend on the journey and an artist of the soul. And let me just praise the Lord by saying, yippee i o Kaye, Layton's here. Welcome him, everybody. You once were young. <laughs> One of the young leaders, now you're getting up there, man. Uh, I walked in here this morning, and I don't know whether you came in time to see the screen back there. It said, Leighton Four, lost and found in the East Lobby. <laughs> so if anybody out there is still looking, tell them I made it up here today. <laughs> and to be here with uh, Jeannie, to be back at Wheaton with our daughter and son-in-law, to see John Ennis again is... Uh, is more than, than special. Uh, I'm thinking back a long time ago this morning I, when I transferred here as a sophomore from Canada. How many Canadians here today? Hey, let's stand and sing O Canada, all right? We'll try anyway. uh, 
And I remember two things from my first uh, September, going over to a little church in uh, Western Springs and hearing a virtually unknown young preacher named Billy Graham, known to Youth for Christ, and that was about all, preach, took off for California and led his first great campaign in which his ministry became known nationwide and around the world. I'll never forget that. And I remember one of my first days here on campus walking from Williston across to Blanchard, and a guy came walking the other day, looked at me, gave me a great big smile, waved at me, and said, Hi, Leighton. And I thought, how does he know my name? It was Bud Schaefer, president of the student body, wonderful guy, gifted athlete, little all-American basketball player. And I learned later that he had taken the time to learn the face and the name of every incoming student so he could say hi and call us by name and make us feel, hey, we belong here. I'll never forget that. Hi, Leighton, on the campus. So that comes back to me. So hi to you today. What if you got a... None of you are texting right now, are you? (laughs) What if you got a text during or after chapel? from someone you know and greatly admire and who has really influenced you. And they said, I'm thinking of you today. I think of you all the time. I pray for you often. I really miss you. I remember uh, when you went off to school this year, uh, there were some tears because I knew I was really going to miss you. I'm so thankful for you and your family and your parents. I'm so thankful for the faith that's in you, and I just think you've got tremendous potential. What would it feel like if you got a personal message like that? Well, that's the message that came from a mentor to one of his mentorees. Came from Paul. Do we have any? uh, I met a Paul, by the way, from graduate school this morning, walking over there in Lincoln. Do we have any Timothys here this morning? Must be at least one Timothy someplace back there. (laughs) No? Well, we better name. I I name you Timothy for for this morning, okay? (laughs) And you can be Timothy the second. I wanted to be Timothy. Yeah. So Paul writes to this, this young friend of his, and he says, I'm writing to Timothy, this is 2 Timothy chapter 1, I'm writing to Timothy, my dear son, with grace, mercy, and peace. And then he says, I'm writing you with three reminders. The first reminder is, I want to remind you of the faith that is in you that came from your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded also is in you. I'm so thankful for those who gave you the faith and passed it on, and now it's living in you. Just want to remind you of that history that you have. His second reminder is to say, and Timothy, I want to remind you to stir up, fan into flame, the gift of God that is in you. You have a gift God has given you. And I want to see you make it kindle. I want you to keep it burning because you have a very, you're a gifted person. God has given you a very special gift. That's my second reminder. His third reminder comes at the beginning of the second chapter when he says, Timothy, you know, I've been through some tough times and I know you will be as you follow uh, the Lord. I want you to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then what you have heard from me In the presence of many witnesses, I want you to pass that on to others who will keep passing it on. Those three reminders that he gives to him. A mentor to his young mentoree, Timothy. And I want you to think about that with me this morning in in a pretty personal way. The first reminder, I'm reminded of your faith and where it comes from. Who did you receive the faith from? Who is the most influential person in linking you to Jesus? Who is the most influential person calling you on to serve the Lord? Who was that person that it came from? Who was your starting spiritual mentor? I'm thinking of of my own. Uh, My full name is, believe it or not, Leighton Frederick Sandus McRae Peter Morgan Mahaffey Ford. Repeat that, please. See how quick you are. Where did you get that? I'm adopted. That's my birth name was Peter Morgan Mahaffey, my adopted name, Leighton Frederick Sandus Ford. I didn't know I was adopted until I was 12, and my uh, little, she was 4 foot 11, I was 6 foot 2. I should have realized there was (laughs) something besides genetics involved there. 
She took me for a walk in the park and said I was adopted and said we, we loved you, we chose you, made me feel very special. She was uh, my first mentor, and she was a very troubled one. She loved the Lord. She had wanted to be a missionary. She knew the Bible. She introduced me to the Bible and prayer and held up books about Christian leadership. And yet she was in herself very, very troubled, really paranoid in a way. I had the blessing of a, of a troubled, paranoid mother. I look back on that, and I realize that even though she wanted to live her life through me, God used her to call me. Some of us have had similar experiences. I think of another. When I was 14, in our hometown in Canada, a man named Evan Headley came to start Youth for Christ. Youth for Christ was just beginning then. A little group of us came together, and he said, if you want to have Youth for Christ, you need to have some officers. So someone in front of mine nominated me as president, and uh, Evan appointed me as president. He thought I was 17 because I was tall. I was 14. When he learned I was only 14, I think he almost had a heart attack. But he helped me. He stuck with me. He encouraged me. I, I called him this week. He's 96 now, living in Southern California, and still mentoring a half a dozen young guys. They were mentors to me. Lois and Eunice were to Timothy. Who were yours? Tell me, a few of you, what's, give me the first name of someone who really influenced you. Anybody? Who brought you? Somebody else. Isaac, Harry, Mark, Will. How about you, Timothy? <laughs> Who is it? Jeremy. Jeremy. Have you told them thank you recently? Paul said to Timothy, be grateful for those who are your starting mentors. Lon, every once in a while, will call me to encourage me. You remember Ken Shigematsu was here a couple of weeks ago? He was one of the, when I met him first, he was a student at Wheaton. But once a week, Ken will call me, not to ask anything necessarily, but just to say, how are you? That means so much to me. So think of those who are your starting mentors and be grateful to them. And then the second reminder Paul has to Timothy, he says, I remind you, stir up that gift you have in you. Kindle that flame. Those are his exact words to him. He says, Timothy, God did not give us a spirit of timidity. Fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands. You have a gift. We all have a gift from God. Timothy, you have a very special one that's just you. And this gift, he says, it's initiated by God. It's the gift of God. It is recognized by others. Timothy, you remember we laid your hands on you because we saw something in you that God was going to use. But it has to be stimulated and kindled over and over again by you. So I remind you, keep stirring that into flame. Who is a mentor who is a stirring mentor, I wonder, in your life right now? Keeping that flame going. I remember meeting a Georgia Tech student a few years, some years ago now, actually about 40 years, who said, an engineering student, he said, uh, Dr. Ford, I believe God's calling me to serve him, but I'm afraid that flame isn't going to keep burning all of my life. Last year, I had the privilege of installing him as a pastor of a church, and he said, I remember what you said. You said, Peter, sometimes that flame will burn lower, sometimes it'll be higher. Just pray that it will burn on. I pray that for you, but you've got to kindle it and stimulate it. That's what Paul said to, uh, to Timothy. And that can burn down easily, can't it? Busyness, Lon Allison said the other day, I think the number one value of evangelical leaders in America is, I wonder what you'd say. I said, what? He said, I think it's frenzied busyness. Because when we get together, he's talking about mature leaders. We talk about how busy we are. Too busy, perhaps, to pay attention, to kindle that flame again and again in our hearts. My brother-in-law did that for me. When they came to my hometown to speak uh, when I was 17, and that's when he told me about Wheaton College. That's when he told me about his kid sister back in North Carolina. He became a kind of a matchmaker for me. And uh, we first met at the base of the stairs at Blanchard. I went and walked there the other day. She was coming down, I was looking up, and I couldn't stop looking. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, Billy had, has this, you know, when, when he would have people sing just as I am, we all knew everybody would just about come. It was this amazing gift he had. That night, only one person came. She already knew the Lord. 
I was so disappointed. And I remember afterwards, Billy came to the side of the little platform at our school where we were meeting, and he put an arm around me. And he said, Leighton, I believe God has given you a desire to serve the Lord and see people come to know Christ. And I'm going to pray for you, and I believe if you stay humble, God will use you. I've never forgotten that arm around the shoulder. And the doors that he opened for me, when he went to New York City for that crusade in 1957, he asked me to come up to his home in Montreat. He said, I want you and Jeannie to go up to New York and, and live there for a year in Manhattan and get the churches and enlist them in this crusade. I was 23. It was the biggest crusade he'd ever had. And I think back, if that had been me, would I have put a young guy, I, I mean, he knew me, he knew I had some background experience in ministry, but he would entrust that to me? Would I do that for somebody else? that arm around the shoulder. I also think I was stirred into flame here at Wheaton by Art Holmes. Most of you don't know Art. When I came here, he was a young philosophy professor from England by Canada. I started taking philosophy. I majored in philosophy. Through Art Holmes, I learned, many of you have heard this, all truth is God's truth. It, the comprehensiveness of the faith, all things centered in Christ, I didn't know back then how God would use that in my life because one of my own major strengths I've found out across the years is connecting, connecting ideas, connecting people, as bringing leaders together in the Lausanne Committee. But it was Art Holmes who stimulated that in the class, in the reading, in the lectures. All truth is God's truth. He stirred me. I pray that you will find some stirring mentors, maybe an upperclassman, maybe a professor, maybe just somebody here in town you can go and say, would you let me just come and listen? I, I found in mentoring young leaders around the world, most say, I want a, a senior leader not to tell me what to do, but to listen to me, not to have an agenda for me, but to say, I want you to find what God's agenda is for you. And I want to encourage, Lon reminded me years ago, I said to him, Lon, who 10 years younger than you are you mentoring? You're not too young to do that. There's someone two or three years behind you, someone 10 years younger. That kind of interest will make a tremendous difference in your life. Stir in the flame. I also thought, I walked by the old gym, we used to call it alumni gym, and thought of five or six of us who met every afternoon about five o'clock and prayed together very loudly sometimes. Some of them are with the Lord, some of them still serving Christ. They stirred that in the flame in my heart. Pay attention to all the ways in which God is stirring. Don't be so busy you can't stop. Pay attention to His Word. Pay attention to the beauty of what's going on in this world. One of my favorite poets is Mary Oliver, great American poet. She has a little three-line poem that she calls Instructions for Living a Life. It simply says, pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. Pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. And I think, how often do I go through a day I haven't paid attention, I haven't been astonished, I don't have anything to tell about? I was a few minutes ago walking down Lincoln, and there's a, little, there's a house there, the backyard is in Lincoln, there's a little white gate, some of you may know it, beautiful little white gate with a lantern over it, and this wonderful path. And I stopped and looked at that, it made me think of T.S. Eliot's great poem about exploring beyond the unknown remembered gate. And to me, it was a symbol reminding me of the gate of Christ, the gate in which he has led me. Pay attention. Maybe there's going to be something today. Pay attention to others. Pay attention to your own heart. Don't be so busy that you can't stop sometimes and say, God, stir up that gift again. The third reminder, Paul said to young Timothy, is I remind you, be strong in the Lord, and I urge you, pass it on. What you have received from me and trust, don't keep it to yourself. Pass it on and entrust it to others. What? The gospel, which Paul said was a trust given to me, and of which my brother-in-law has been so faithful across the years. Uh, we were up there to see him about two weeks ago, 95. He's not the strong young preacher he was then, a weak voice. But he wants to preach once more about the cross, which he will on national television on November the 7th. This trust, the gospel of which Paul was a herald, and the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be grateful for the mentors who started you. Be attentive to the mentors who may stir you. Be generative as a mentor to those who are going to follow you. 
to pass it on. What's going to be left as your legacy at Wheaton, I wonder? That arm around the shoulder, that was 60 years ago. I'll never forget it. That little word from Bud Schaefer as I walked across the campus, what am I doing here? Another country, a new place. Hi, Leighton, that wave of the hand. That smile, that word from you. And the fire not only kindled and burning within yourself, but by God's grace letting it blaze and glow around this world of ours, the light of Christ. One of the reasons that Jeannie and I have been so involved, as Lon said, in this major shift in my life to try to identify and develop, bring together men and women like you with fresh new visions. It also goes back to our family. My wife's mother is a godly woman. When she was dying at about 87, 1981, August, Jeannie was there with her, and she motioned to Jeannie to lean over, and she got her hands up. It's not easy to put them on Jeannie's shoulders and said, daughter, Pass it on. Pass it on to every generation. Well, she did that to her son, Billy. Billy was preaching on television, and our older son, Sandy, Debbie's brother, was about five or six, and he was watching at home. He saw all those people coming down to Just As I Am, chaplain. And he said, do I have to be there to do that? Jeannie said, no, and he opened his young heart to the Lord. Sandy was your age, junior at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, seeking to be a, as what he called a horizon Christian, close to the light but close enough to bring others, trying to live as a light of Christ there. And four months after Jeannie's mother died, Sandy had heart surgery for a heart arrhythmia problem. Uh, a young athlete, a runner, after eight hours of surgery, they came and said, we fixed the heart, but we couldn't get it to start again. He was gone. A young man with a heart for God. And the Lord led us to say, let's try to help other young men and women to run their race for Christ, to keep their heart burning, and to pass it on. It's a legacy to me. It's a legacy to Jeannie, from someone your age. He, did, he wrote... A few days before he died, I still have dreams of what life should be and what I can do, but life to me seems really short. He didn't know how short it was, but he did pass it on through me. So my word to you this morning about mentoring, be grateful for those who first mentored you. Let them know it. Pay attention to those who are stirring you now. Your Anamkaras is the old Celtic word, your soul friends, teachers, friends, whoever it may be. Pay attention to them. Be generative in passing it on to every generation. I'd like you to give the final closing benediction in a different way. Instead of my doing it, I'm going to say, Timothy, stand up, if you will. <laughs> Pass it on to every generation, and pass it on to him, and pass it on to her, and you pass it on to whoever's next to you, will you? Go ahead, right now. Pass it on. <laughs>